it's it's Julian Assange and WikiLeaks that have returned honor to to journalism. Julian is a truth teller, and that's what has upset the those who continue what Goebbels called the big lie. <laughs> Was, um, the great John Pilger at the very top, um, and of course, uh, the great Anton Karras, the third man. Uh, I'm Randy Credico, Randy Credico live on the fly here on 99.5 FM in New York City, WBAI.org. Give to WBAI.org if you want to support the station. Also, this is um, one of our special programs, uh, Assange's Countdown to Freedom, uh, and you can see all of our listen to both uh all 80 of them at our website assange countdown to freedom.com uh one of my uh guests last year on assange countdown to freedom.com is someone everybody knows at wbai and everyone's afraid of uh who tries to uh, fix the electoral process and that is the great investigative journalist author of many books best-selling author greg palace greg it's uh, good to see you Hey, Again. good to see you, Randy, even if it's Zoom. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, you know, it, it, it's, I didn't like it at first, but, you know, it's very convenient. Uh, so, um, you know, it's what you got to do uh, during the pandemic. And I kind of got uh, not hooked on it, but uh, relied on it a lot. Uh, but there's nothing like live radio. OK, that's in a league of its own. You know, that's where my heart is live radio. So, uh, Greg, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on uh, yeah. that's going to be uh, in, in, uh, on the West Coast right now. As you know, uh, the brother and the son of Julian Assange are uh, traveling around the country like de Tocqueville did in the 18th and uh, 19th century. Uh, but they're out there. Uh, Don't start good... showing off your erudition to me, Mr. Credico. All right. Well, I, I knew you flunked out of history. Are you serious? You really want to talk history with me? Uh, now, now okay, go ahead. all right. So my history is I did a show with you. I did. I read for one of your books. Uh -huh. One of your books, remember, with Larry right. David, you I, did, I did George Bush and I, I did Kissinger and I did Reagan. But that's not what we're here to talk about, nor to Tocqueville. Uh, we're talking about this tour that uh, is on the West Coast now, started out in Miami, then went to Boston, and then we were in New York together. Uh, and uh, it's in Oakland, uh, Saturday night, and uh, it's in L.A. on Sunday and Monday. That's Sunday right. at the, uh, at the uh, let's see, Pacific time, 6 p.m., which would be 9 p.m. here, at the Oakwood Reception Center. It's a public gathering. So you know where that place is. And there's something Monday that you are also. Yes, there'll be a second event, uh, which will be in on Mount Washington, which is uh, um, right near Highland Park. And then uh, you can all join me. If, so check out the address in Mount Washington. That will be going from four to six. It will also be live streamed. Don't miss it with me, Greg Palast, and other luminaries, and especially members of the Assange family. Um, and uh, afterwards, you can join me at uh, Johnny's for a drink in Highland Park. Oh, I'd love to. I really would. But the prices are too high at that place. Uh, <laughs> let me let me ask you this. Emotional price. Yes. yes. You've been uh, you were very, um, you know, uh, solid the last time I had you on talking about Assange. I, I suppose you've been paying attention uh, to uh, the events, the, the courtroom, uh, you know, proceedings uh, over the last year and a half. Uh, what did you make of it? I mean, just him being in that glass cage. It was like it was like Eichmann in a glass cage. Did you see it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. As as if Julian can breathe fire and singe everyone. Uh, 
<laughs> well, because he's already done that journalistically. Look, it's real simple. We got a journalist on trial. You know, I was just listening to National Petroleum Radio. They have a program, Media Matters. And it was all about how Putin is, is uh, you know, manipulating the media and, and uh, jailing uh, uh, journalists under trumped up charges. Yeah, well, uh, did he indict Julian Assange? I mean, I don't understand. If it's Putin that's doing this and, and, uh, and it's the Russians that uh, are... Um, putting uh, journalists in dungeons, then how come uh, uh, Mr. Assange, my uh, journalistic colleague, is in a glass box and in chains? What's going on here? You know, his, his crime is committing journalism. Right. And, you know, uh, and let's not forget that this indictment didn't come down from Agent Orange from Trump. It came down from uh, Mr. Obama. And now here we are with Biden. You know, it's time for Biden to do the right thing and say and give Julian Assange the Medal of Freedom. Well, actually, Trump is the guy that it started out with Obama. They passed and then Trump uh, went after him. And now Biden, who was with Obama at the time when they decided that this might cross uh, First Amendment uh, protection rights, uh, he's he's appealing appealing the verdict by the judge, which is not to send them uh, to the U.S. because of the bad prison conditions here. You're an investigative uh, journalist. You've been uh, around the block uh, many times, even though mm -hmm. you're a man. So, I mean, you know how bad the prison conditions are in this country. You've heard, uh, you've done stuff on it. Uh, and, and that's the correct decision, uh, not sending him here on that. Plus, they shouldn't be charging him with anything. I mean, what, what to you, what does this mean? What's the implications if he is actually extradited and put in prison to a, an investigative journalist? Does this intimidate or scare you? It should intimidate and scare every journalist. Well, I don't know if I'll be intimidated. I will be scared. And I've brought out this, this point before. I know that there are some people who don't like things that Julian has said. They don't like his attitude. They don't like his beard. They don't like his lack of a beard. It's whatever. That's not the point. He's in prison for a single reason is that he broke. He should be getting the pool of surprise. He broke one of the biggest stories of the century. The, the brilliant work that uh, they did with WikiLeaks and the Chelsea Manning revelations. These are vitally important revelations. And I have to tell you, I use some of that material, too. So if he's in leg irons, why aren't I? Why aren't I in a glass box? What you know? And that's the other thing is that you got guys like uh, Nicholas Khrushchev and others from the um, you know, from the New York Times who are more than happy to use Assange's material to win awards and write books and write columns and preen on what great journalists they are, except that um, they don't mind Julian being in leg irons in uh, in in prison for the rest of his life. That's OK with them. I even heard, uh, you know, one of the New York Times reporters, uh, the New York Times editorialized that Julian, uh, that uh, Chelsea Manning, the source, uh, was given too long a prison sentence, 30 years. That was too long. I'm, I want to tell you this. Any journalist that says that their source should be in prison at all, not just 30 years is too much. I'll just make it three. No, 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 no. No. Any journalist that says a source or a fellow journalist working with them on a story should be in prison. They are not journalists. What, what do that's you the problem that we have in America. We have too many repeaters of government of official government um, propaganda and not enough reporters. Repeaters, not reporters. And Assange is guilty, literally. I mean, it was stunning to hear, you know, this NPR report, Media Matters, about the terrible things that uh, Putin does to journalists. And, and here we are. Has he put someone in, a, is he threatening to put someone in prison the rest of their of their life because of what they've reported? Right. It, well, so let me ask you this, Greg. I mean, you, you see CNN, uh, MSNBC called Lean Forward. Why aren't people like Ari Melbert, Lawrence O'Donnell, uh, Ali Velshi, why don't they go out and flag? Do you think that they have the clamps on them from upstairs? 
Look, the, they're pundits. They're not journalists. And I don't expect them to be journalists. Does anyone pretend that they're journalists? No. I mean, you know, uh, oh, I think Ollie I don't Velcro call anything like Harry Melbourne, bro. You know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not journalism. It's punditry. It's commentary. And that's the one thing that we've gone into the U.S. We've stopped journalism. We're just yakking away. It's just yak, 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 talk, talk, talk. And if you try to bring a journalistic report like one uh, that you're going to be playing uh, shortly that I just released, where is MSNBC on these things or MSDNC, as I call it? That's the other thing is that it's become so partisan and so hack like. In other words, they have discussions. Well, is Biden wonderful or is he Jesus Christ on a pogo stick? No, I think he's actually Mahatma Gandhi come back, you know, <laughs> with with dark glasses. Uh, no, uh, you know, so uh, and then, of course, so it's you know, it's just an inversion of, of the Fox stuff. But so I, the, journalism ain't there anymore. I mean, what, frankly, when was the last major story that the New York Times broke or the last major story that the Washington, you know, the Washington Post broke? I know that they broke the Watergate story. That was 40 years ago, guys. Let's. Right. And the Pentagon Papers. And, uh, you know, yeah. let me tell you about the Pentagon. Actually, it's very interesting to bring up Pentagon Papers. Do you know that Pentagon Papers, even even and this is the good, the heyday of the New York Times and the Post. Um, they didn't want to publish this stuff. You know, and, and in fact, in the My Lai massacre, uh, Seymour Hersh's great story, uh, it was actually first broken by R the great Ron and uh, late great Ron Ridenour, who was right, with right. Stripes. They wanted to put it out, him, uh, Ridenour and Seymour Hersh. And Hersh is working for the New York Times. They wouldn't touch it. They wouldn't touch it. So Ridenour and Hersh threatened, threatened to read uh, the story of the My Lai massacre and put up the photos on the steps of the Pentagon. And to actually get it out, they had to create their own news service, specific news service. So that, you know, basically we've always had trouble with real journalism in America, but this is a new threat to say that you go to prison for releasing real reports. That's the whole point of investigative journalism to cover up, you know, that's the other thing is, let me, in fact, actually, I don't think a lot of people know some of the content of the WikiLeaks papers, which are really important. I mean, every, you know, for example, I use the story in uh, on British television. We talk about the uh, the Deepwater Horizon explosion 10 years ago, back in April of 2010. The Deepwater Horizon exploded and, you know, was played here in the U.S. as, oh, that's a terrible accident. And British Petroleum, they, they're going to apologize. They're going to clean up and Mother Nature will clean up all that crap. But the truth is, the truth was is that British Petroleum and its partners Exxon and Chevron knew that just 17 months before the, before the Deepwater Horizon blew up, that same exact type of rig, a trans-ocean deepwater rig, using the same dangerous method called quick dry nitrogen quick dry cement, blew up in the Caspian Sea. It blew out. The same exact accident happened in the Caspian Sea 17 months before, and it was covered up. Now, why do I tell you this? How do I know it? I got an inside source at BP that told me, uh, you know, an insider from BP. But then I got a confirmation from a guy named Julian Assange, who had papers, wiki, the documents from the State Department, in which the Bush State Department, this is Condoleezza Rice, knew that there was a blowout of a deep water rig, transocean British Petroleum rig in the Caspian Sea, and they covered it up. The Interior Department in the U.S. said, don't drill in the Gulf of Mexico with that thing. And they said, oh, it's safe. We haven't had an accident in 50 years. No, they had an accident a year and a half earlier, guys. They were lying to Congress under oath, and Assange's work helped me bust that story. Now, it's true. I was on the front page of The Guardian, I was in a program called Dispatches, which is prime time in England, and we busted that story. It didn't come to the U.S., of course, because there's a second wall of censorship, even on getting out the news out of the Assange papers, the Assange WikiLeaks papers. But I want to tell you, these, this is important stuff. Your government is lying to you, and he proved it. He showed us the inside documents that, you, that Bush, Condoleezza Rice were lying through their teeth at you, and people died because of it. Thank you, Julian, for releasing this information, for confirming a really important story that we're able to get out, at least in, in, in England, if not in the U.S. Well, you know, it, I, I think it, like we were talking about earlier, it sends such a chill. Uh, I, I guess the government, uh, the powers that be, 
just don't want someone like Assange or any of his followers uh, that are into the same kind of journalism to do that kind of journal journalism. And I think they're just trying to neutralize it. Well, that's the other thing is that, uh, you know, um, <laughs> that, that same media program I was listening to, <laughs> they had uh, on, on NPR, uh, they brought on a Times reporter whose um, phone contacts were subpoenaed uh, they, by the Trump administration. They said, oh, well, you must be happy now that, they're, that uh, this uh, Trump process of going after journalists, um, that uh, it's all changed under Biden. He said, no, that wasn't the process under Trump. He just continued what Obama did. Right. He said, this is the Obama system. So it's by partisan attack on the rights of journalists to expose government perfidy and lies and BS and stuff that will kill you that they want to keep from you. So this is, by the way, my friends, this is not your documents in government. It's our documents. It's right. documents right. of we the people. And all Assange did was show us our own documents. We own those wiki. Those, those are not WikiLeaks papers. They're um, United States citizen owned papers. But the government doesn't want you to have them. And, and they want to make sure that Julian is an example so that journalists like Greg Palace know that they are under threat. If I get now, what happens if I get, you know, inside documents, which I do? Yes. You have no idea. The, and, uh, you know, and by the way, I'm, uh, the attacks on me are coming from both the Republicans and the Democrats for revealing inside documents. I know and, that. You know, and we're talking with Greg Palace, the award winning investigative journalist, uh, great movies you've put out. Uh, I've attended uh, the openings of, of a few. The um, best democracy money can buy. Yeah. Thank you, Randy. And you also, Randy's voice, when you hear George Bush and Pat Robertson, that's well, actually thank Randy thank Credico you very in, much, in the audio book. Yeah, thank you money very money. much, Jesus. Now, I want to change the subject. Uh, yeah. If he's so close to God, how come God doesn't fix that neck of his? Now, let me ask you this, Greg. All right, not, not ask you this, but I want to go into your most recent uh, investigative mm -hmm. journalism bonanza, and that is uh, what you just discovered. You've been doing uh, voter suppression stuff for a decade, if not longer, but your most recent one uh, took place in Georgia. Want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, for the uh, for Tom Hartman and uh, Brian Roth's investigates, uh, I went to Georgia and several months of investigation. What we found is that uh, the Georgia Republican Party operatives working with a Texas group has challenged the right of 364,000, a third of a million Georgians to cast votes. This is private parties saying you can't vote. Now, they don't use white sheets to stop people. They use spreadsheets. They got a bunch of they got this hit list from this group in Texas saying that people didn't live in the counties where they were voting. And I spoke to people, interestingly, mostly voters of color the color being blue, and they add, uh, for example, this woman, Tamara Horn, she lost uh, her home because of COVID. She had to sell her home, move in with her relatives down the street. She's still a legal voter in that county, but, but she was challenged. Her right to vote was challenged, not by the government, understand, but by this private party. Now, how can you do that under a brand new Georgia law signed by Brian Kemp um, in uh, March called SB 202? It said that any voter can challenge an unlimited number of other voters. I went and spoke to this one woman, you'll see a little film, Pamela Means is her, excuse me. Yeah, uh, Pamela Reardon is her name, and Pamela Reardon. And she is a running for vice chair of the Georgia Republican Party. She's the candidate of Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, the, the uh, famous, the, you know, the one with the Jewish space lasers. Uh, <laughs> And um, now there's a journalist. Uh, but so she personally, this woman, this GOP operative, she's already a GOP official, has personally challenged 32,000 people, including this woman, black woman, Tamara Horn and other people uh, on on false, false claims. She never checked any of this. I said, that, you know, she never talked to this woman, uh, Tamara. She doesn't know who she is. She's just a name on a list that she passed on. And now I did warn her that this game may be okay in Georgia, but Georgia is still technically part of the United States. And therefore you're subject to the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. This kind of game 
if there is justice and if our justice department is actually going to commit itself to justice, you go to jail for this stuff. One woman, one woman challenging 32,000 voters altogether, the GOP challenging 364,000 voters. This has not been uncovered by the mainstream media. They're too busy um, applauding the prosecution of Mr. Assange. Okay. And once again, what do I do if I get this stuff in from inside government? Now I'm, you know, you may go to jail. They may go after you, yeah. committing espionage. Now let, let, let's uh, play this clip. Um, just set this up, and we'll play that clip, and we'll come right back after. Okay, uh, there I am in Georgia, in front of the state capitol, telling you, and then I'm about to go in and meet this Republican official, personally challenging thirty-two thousand people, and we've bleeped out her. Uh, Salty yeah. language. Yeah. And I, one thing I, by the way, I left out of the film because in that space is that when she, you'll see that she kind of throws my behind out when I ask her too many questions. And I did move quickly because she had a loaded shotgun next to her door and between us on a table. All right. Well, don't spoil handgun. it for us. Don't spoil it for no, us. No, you won't see the handguns. <laughs> I promise. Okay. We're going to play this clip and be, and be right back with the, the great investigative journalist, Greg Pallas. Marietta, Georgia. We're about to meet with a GOP official who says that she has personal knowledge that 32,000 people are voting illegally in this county. So my name is Pamela Reardon. I am currently 6th District Committee Woman to the State Party. I know for sure voters do not live here. Altogether, Reardon and her cronies are challenging 364,000 citizens' right to vote. This year, Georgia's GOP-controlled legislature passed a new law saying you can challenge an unlimited number of voters. Do you know this woman? That, do, you, do you recognize that woman? Um, not offhand. I don't... Okay, you never spoke to her? No, no. What, what about this guy and his wife on his honeymoon? Do you recognize that man? Mm, no. So you didn't call him, but you challenged his right to vote or have his ballot challenged. Sir, get out of my house. Okay, I will get, get out, out of your house. house. ACLU of Georgia Attorney Rahul Garabadu. The challenge statute doesn't, didn't ever contemplate someone coming to town and challenging hundreds of thousands of voters at one time. Um, this, in our view, was an abuse of that statute. That doesn't mean that you get to print out reams and reams of Excel spreadsheets and just you know levy a charge against thousands of people that you don't even know and get them you know removed off the rolls the 1871 Ku Klux Klan Act makes voter intimidation a crime imagine using the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871 here is NAACP lawyer Gerald A Griggs you know it all, it gets real when you get arrested it gets real real you've heard of the Ku Klux Klan law of 1871 I'm from Canada so you don't know the Ku Klux Klan law. I'm from Canada. You clearly don't know Georgia law. He's a legal voter. I got voter. my right to vote in 94. Okay, so you so I don't like people voting illegally. Get out of my house now. I shall get out of your house Before now. Before I throw you. And, and you are sure that this is your legal voting address? You are Georgia, divided down the middle. And this civil war ain't over. This is Greg Pallas in Georgia reporting. Wow, that was crazy. Who filmed that? Who filmed that? Actually, I use uh, the great Zach D. Roberts because he's not afraid of guns. He, in fact, uh, 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 Roberts uh, was uh, famously had um, uh, took those devastating pictures in Charlottesville when a school teacher was nearly beaten to death. People don't know that he got those photos, which saved that teacher's life, a black teacher who was being beaten by five um, white nationalists, there was a gun in Zach's face and he kept shooting. You know, it's like, shoot me, I've still got the film. And so I, that's why I use um, combat photographers. I use the, uh, like uh, Rick Rowley or I use um, uh, Zach D. Roberts and others who are not afraid of people putting guns in your face or, um, and certainly not gonna be afraid of, of people just being nasty little, I won't say it. Well, all right, well, uh, Greg, uh, that kind of stuff can get you in trouble in the future if this uh, 
process against Julian Assange is successful by the U.S. government, the Biden, the progressive Biden administration. Go figure. All right. So um, just continue doing the good work. Uh, do, how do people uh, reach you, uh, Greg? OK, if you want to see the film, if you want to pass on, get more information, the follow up, go to gregpalast.com. That's G-R-E-G. P-A-L-A-S-T, and do catch me uh, either virtually or in person in Mount Washington, Los Angeles on Monday um, in the afternoon. Go to uh, gregpals.com. We'll post that up. Okay. And, uh, uh, and if you're listening to WBAI, keep it alive, man. It's your station. Right. And one more thing. Um, uh, sun, it's Sunday. You may not be there. Maybe you will be. We'll see. At, the, uh, at 6 p.m. Pacific time at the Oakwood reception center it's a, a public gathering and the, the monday is uh where at, at from four to six pacific time uh with marjorie cohen steve Rody, greg palace uh there give us that address again okay i don't have the address right off but you're gonna flash up on screen and you'll cut that right in won't you all right yes we will all right thank you greg palace keep up the good work and uh, we'll talk uh, very soon we'll be right back here with uh, Randy Credico live on the fly, Assange Countdown to Freedom, uh, after a quick break with some more special guests. Credico, Randy Credico live on the fly on 99.5 FM in New York City. Uh, this is a special Assange Countdown to Freedom. You can get all of our programs on Assange at AssangeCountdownToFreedom.com or RandyCredico.com. All, mil I don't know, 120 uh, so far. You can watch them or you can listen to them. And we are joined uh, right now by someone that has been a staunch supporter of uh, Julian Assange, and he's a longtime activist. He ran for president. I've seen him speak. He's brilliant at the uh, left forum in uh, 2020, 2019. Uh, and uh, that's uh, Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Mackler. Is that, did I pronounce it right? You got it. Everybody calls me Jeff. All right, we'll call you Jeff. So Jeff, uh, thank you for joining us, uh, first of all. And uh, how did you get involved? I know you're involved in this thing on uh, Saturday uh, in uh, in Oakland. Do you want to tell us about that event in Oakland? We have an incredible event. And while I'm known for exaggeration, it's been a long time since we've had 40 different groups come together to sponsor our event. We had to call maybe 15 different halls because nobody has been uh, making their places available until we found this fantastic place, the Islamic Cultural Center in downtown Oakland at 1433 Madison Street. So we started assembling a team of people to draw an audience. And lo and behold, we ran into my old friend, Alice Walker, Pulitzer Prize winner. She's going to be there in person, along with John and uh, Gabriel Shipton, the father and brother of Julian. And then we have um, via Zoom connections, Noam Chomsky, Dan Ellsberg, and Mumia Abu-Jamal. Mumia is a long-term supporter. And Alice, Noam, and uh, Dan are the three national co-coordinators of AssangeDefense.org. So they are long-distance players, and they're in this battle because it's a fundamental one for free speech, not to mention free journalists. You can't have much of a free speech if you don't have journalists who aren't in jail. So uh, we're looking for a mass rally. We have other speakers like Joe Lombardo, who is the national coordinator of the United National Anti-War Coalition, Cynthia Papermaster, the leader of Code Pink in the Bay Area, Dennis Bernstein, who's the Flashpoints host of KPFA, and Nozomi Hayashi, who is the author of WikiLeaks, The Global Fourth Estate, 
history is happening. So we got a great live lineup. And uh, of course, this is, this is Mumia's third Julian Assange event. And we have 30, if not 40 endorsers because the entire radical, progressive, socialist, free speech movement comes together when the government tries to deny the right of a journalist to tell the truth about US policy. Well, that, that's well said. Uh, and that, that is a Saturday at the, uh, at the Islamic Cultural Center. I know where that is. It's uh, off of a Madison and, uh, and 14th or 15th Street because my friend has an apartment uh, right down the street there from Lake, Lake Merritt up, right? Am I correct? It's three blocks off Lake Merritt. It's right near the Lake Merritt BART station, a seven minute walk between 14th and 15th, wheelchair accessible. We're gonna have a fantastic crowd. We urge everybody to be there at two o'clock this coming Saturday, Pacific June 26th. Time. Two o'clock, June 26th. Right, arrive a little bit early. We have wheelchair access. We also have a sort of a special reception for Gabriel and uh, John on Friday, wine and cheese. And that would be um, at five to seven in Oakland. If you're interested in that, uh, give me a call and uh, we'll save some tickets for you. It's a sort of an intimate meeting with the Assange family. I think Alice might be there with us as well. Call me at 510-268-9400. Two nine, and we'll reserve a ticket. I'm going to call you right now. I think I'll call you right now just to get a ticket while we're doing this. Would that be okay? <laughs> sure. So look, look, I, I'm uh, waiting for you. All right. <laughs> I'm going to see if it works. No, I, I can't do it right now. But um, I actually have my little dog next to me and she's begging me for shrimp. Uh, get away, Bianca. Now, I, I just, uh, getting back to this uh, national committee and, and you representing the Bay Area. Uh, you've been doing that for how long? Well, we're about a year and a half old. In fact, a year and a half ago on the eve of COVID, we had a major event scheduled for the Humanist Hall. We were bringing out Nathan Fuller, who is the director of the Courage Foundation that defends um, all whistleblowers, whether it be uh, Julian Assange or, uh, or um, Chelsea Manning or Chelsea Thomas Manning or Edward Snowden and all the others. But Courage Foundation is, and, and Nathan are the power behind it. They started a national committee and we have branches in across the United States. We're in the course of touring the Shiptons in some 10 cities. Check it out at assangedefense.org for the entire tour schedule. We started in Miami. We have been in Milwaukee, New York City, Minneapolis, um, and we're going to Portland, then the Bay Area on the 26th, and then Los Angeles, and then back to Washington, DC. So right. we're running the Assange family a bit ragged. Everybody is joining in. I have yet to find a voice in the progressive movement. All stripes, everybody is on board to free Julian, like we are on board to free Mumia Abu Jamal. And, and Leonard Peltier, let's throw that one in, right? And, joiner, and journalist himself. Mumia recovered from COVID. Uh, I've been working on his case. I'm the director of the mobilization to free Mumia for 35 years. I visit Mumia in prison, and there isn't a fine progressive cause that Mumia isn't behind. He recovered from COVID. He recovered from a, um, a heart uh, operation. A couple of valves were cleared out and we are back in court struggling to free Mumia Abu Jamal. My dream is to have the Oakland Coliseum filled with Mumia and Julian together for two journalists who are setting new paths for freedom of speech and free press. So we're looking for two victories and bringing them home would be fantastic. The name of the tour is uh, Home Run for Julian. It's at homerunforjulian.com. Uh, if you want to uh, check out all of the events, I was at the one in New York uh, last week or the, on June 10th, and it was a spectacular event. Uh, got uh, a lot of play. And um, I know this one in the Bay Area, in Oakland, 
will be a great event too, because you have some of the most solid uh, activists in that uh, area that uh, are always on board uh, for the right causes. And I, I salute you for all the work that you've done. How do, how do people, besides your phone number, if they want to get involved in the local area with your chapter of the Assange defense team, how do they do it? Well, uh, we are setting up a website. You can email me for details, j, the initial Mackler at lmi.net. You have my phone number and you can check all the connections by assangedefense.org. Our event and phone numbers and media releases are available there. Get in touch, join us in the Bay Area. We, we have an ongoing committee that includes everybody. There is 30 to 40 uh, groups are endorsing the entire peace movement, United Anti-War Coalition, Code Pink, the churches, the Unitarians. It is a fantastic coming together of the entire progressive movement. Everyone from Veterans for Peace, all the chapters to the Peace and Justice Centers throughout the Bay Area, Peninsula Peace and Justice Center, San Jose, Oakland, Mount Diablo, you name it. Everybody is on board to free Julian Assange, to bring him home, to force the United States government, the Biden administration to drop its uh, appeal. Uh, the court ruled in Britain against the Trump administration's extradite, extradition efforts and the Biden administration has decided to appeal that ruling. We're pressing them hard to drop that appeal to stop the litigation against Julian. Otherwise, his case is in the courts. There are two more courts to go. But the British courts, sad to say, not for civil liberties, free speech reasons, but because of Julian's poor health, they ruled that if he's sent to the United States and imprisoned here, he's likely to die. So we want to avoid that. We have a court victory under our belts and we're pressing the government of the United States to drop the extradition and let a magnificent journalist live a decent life continuing to expose the politics of the United States government and its wars abroad. Well, excuse the pun, but I find the appeal appalling. And uh, I wanna thank you, uh, Jeff uh, Mackler, uh, for uh, your work on behalf of uh, the emancipation of Julian Assange and all of the other great work you've done throughout uh, your, your uh, activist career. Uh, and uh, we, uh, wish, we wish we were out there in the, the Bay Area for this because I know it's gonna be a knockout. And uh, we're gonna actually uh, be joined after this break, uh, Jeff, by, uh, we're gonna let you go and uh, with Gabriel and John Shipton uh, to talk about uh, the, the uh, the big uh, event out there and elsewhere, uh, the Bay Area, LA, and uh, back to Washington, DC. I really appreciate it. Uh, and we'll see you soon. Next time in, I'm in the Bay Area. Okay? Randy, I'm honored to be with you. And thank you so much for your efforts on behalf of Julian and every other fighter for freedom and cause for humanity. My best. All right, we're gonna go out by, uh, this is uh, Nils Melzer again, playing the piano. He did it for us last week, so we're going to play it again. Uh, and then we'll be back with the Shiptons after uh, Moonlight Sonata by UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Melzer. See you on the other side. That was uh, Nils Melzer.
believe it or not, at the piano once again. Uh, I'm Randy Critical, Randy Critical live on the fly on 99.5 FM uh, here in New York City, uh, streaming at uh, WBAI.org. Also, this show is on uh, Assange Countdown to Freedom. Dot com all of our uh, episodes on Assange. I think about 70 of them you can actually see on Assange Countdown to Freedom.com. And there are some spectacular ones that we've had over the last year and a half. Um, we're continuing. This is, um, you know, one of those Assange Countdown to Freedom episodes that started at BAI uh, in uh, April of 2017 with Julian and John Pilger. Now, at this point, we have Julian's brother, Gabriel Shipton. Uh, joining us. He is on one of these like mammoth tours of the country, starting out in Miami, then going up 1,500 miles to Boston, and then traveling a few hundred miles to New York City, then Philadelphia, and all over Milwaukee. You've been everywhere. What do you think of the country yeah. so far, Gabriel? Thank you. Uh, Thank you once again, Gabriel, for joining us. No, no, it's good to be. Thanks for having us on, and thanks for your, you know, just incredible incredible efforts over the years randy um you know i think the, your library is you know it's just library of podcasts and and and, and shows is um you know uh, there's nothing like it out there <laughs> in in this sort of in the world of um you know my brother so thank you again um i i think we've seen like you know just out, you know outpouring of support uh, in general um you know everywhere we go there's more and more people uh, more and more uh, news outlets turning up, wanting to know why we're here, what we're doing. Um, and and it, I think, yeah, I mean, we were in Minnesota yesterday and we had an event, an event there and there was over a hundred people. Um, so, you know, it's just, yeah. And, and that's, you know, Minneapolis. So it's, um, you know, there's just uh, right across the country, every place we go, there's, uh, there's people who care about um, the freedom of speech aspects of Julian's case. And the transparency and the anti-war uh, that that those those communities are so strong and so uh, and so supportive, and they really see, uh, you know, what this case is about. You know, it's about uh, you know transparency, uh, freedom of speech, being able to find out what uh, you know what the government is doing uh, in, in your names with your your tax dollars. Uh, next up, we have uh, we've got a we're coming, we're, so we're in. I'm in Denver today, um, and we have an event here tomorrow. But you, but um, next, this, we, next uh, up is Oakland. Oakland, and uh, we've been talking about that, uh, Gabriel, with um, with uh, yeah. Jeff uh, Mackler, who's uh, a big organizer, long term supporter, and part of the Def uh, Assange Defense uh, Committee nationally. He represents that area in the Bay Area. And uh, he said, I know this place where you're going on Saturday. It really is a humdinger, man. This is going to be a great program with Alice Walker. Tell us about it. Uh, this is going to be in the afternoon at the Islamic Center yep. in Oakland. So, yes, yeah, so 26th, uh, 26th of June, 2 p.m., the Islamic Center, Islamic Cultural Center in o Oakland. Alice Walker is going to be there with us live. And then we've got two very special guests joining. Uh, from the video, Noam Chomsky and Daniel Ellsberg. So, uh, you know, these, you know, with these guys on our side, how can we, uh, how can we lose, uh, Randy? I think, um, you know, these people, Alice Walker, yourself, uh, Noam Chomsky, Daniel Ellsberg. It's, uh, you know, we're really feeling the love here, man. Like it's, uh, you know, it's there's so much, so many people coming out for Julian, and 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 just, you know, it's it's phenomenal. Are you are you flying most of the time? Are you doing any driving? No, so we we drove uh, we drove all through the Midwest. Um, yeah, so we were driving through all the countryside there, seeing seeing getting getting to see a bit of the country. It's quite flat. A lot yeah. of a lot of water. I can't believe how much water there is. I mean, I was like saying to John, if there was this much, like that, we would have figured out a way in Australia to to pump all the water out of those lakes and send it to the desert or something. Uh, right. It's just incredible how lush and green everything is. Um, well, especially you know, in Minnesota. Way. They call Minnesota the land of a thousand or, or 30,000 or million lakes. I don't know, but there's lakes everywhere. I've been there. Uh, but that part of the country has its own uh, specific uh, special um, uh, beauty. Uh, Denver is a great city. Were you driving uh, around yeah. Denver, that area? Did you go through the Rocky Mountains? Not that this is pertinent. Uh, no, we, we <laughs> flew into Denver. We flew into Denver. I think there's a bit of a 16-hour drive. Uh, but yeah. what, I mean, what really sort of 
you know, in Minnesota, what's something that we do in Australia is an acknowledgement, acknowledgement of the ancestors and, and the original owners of the land uh, and, and, the, and those people. And that, that, that was the first time I think that we'd seen that and that we'd seen that while we've been here uh, in Minnesota before everything started, um, you know, that they acknowledged, uh, you know, who the land belonged to before, before uh, set, settlers came here. And that's something that's really touching because we do that in Australia a lot. Uh, you know, we we have you know we um, you know we we live on stolen land. Uh, you know that that was um, we are settlers and 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 acknowledging the traditional owners and who actually um, own the land. That was really moving for me and something that we do at home a lot. So I, was, I was uh, it was there. nice have, to see. I have a lot of friends in the American Indian movement. I was there at White Earth. Um, uh, what is it called? White Earth Reservation. Uh, about 10 years ago, 13 years ago. And, uh, you know, you're right. You, people don't know the history. And the people don't know the history because they weren't writing about it uh, in the 19th century about the, uh, the genocide. They didn't have a Julian Assange back then. Imagine if they had Julian mm. out there somehow. Uh, it's like what Cornell West said that we're at the 100 year mark, May 31st, of the slaughter of uh, African-Americans in Tulsa by city officials, thousands died. And he said, if there was no reporter reported on it, you know, we know about it now, but if Julian had been there and, you know, he would have put it out there, that would have gotten out there and the whole yeah. world would have known about uh, what happened uh, in Greenwood in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, we're talking with Gabriel Shipton, the brother of Julian Assange. Uh, how's your dad holding up? You guys, uh, he's got a lot of energy. Yeah, he does. He does. He gets a little bit grumpy sometimes, but, uh, you know, we keep him going. Uh, you know, he had, I think, one glass of red wine in the evening and, uh, and, and that's his sort of, um, you know, that's sort of what he looks forward to, I think, <laughs> during the day, the, the, just to end, end off the day with a glass of red wine. Um, uh, but, yeah, there are, there are the moments where, where, you know, he gets a bit grumpy, but uh, we keep pushing him along. He's, uh, he's been great. So, yeah. You guys I know the red wine thing because I saw him having a glass of red wine after the one at the uh, People's Forum in New York City on June 10th. He had that one glass of wine. Now, if I had the one glass, it would be one case of red wine. So, you know, otherwise I'd have the glass, uh, but I can't. Uh, continuing. So now, so now uh, you're, you go to Oakland. Then after that, on the, uh, on the uh, 27th, you're in Los Angeles at uh, 6 p.m at the Oakwood uh, Reception Center uh, at uh, 6 p.m. your time, or California time. So that should be yep. very good. Uh, Greg Palace, who was on earlier, talked about it. He'll be there. And a lot of people are going to show up for this event in Los Angeles. Uh, are you going anywhere else? Are you going to Portland at all? Are you going to be going to Portland? No, no, we're not going to Portland. No, we're sort of focusing on... on um you know, San Francisco and, and, and Oakland and then down to LA. There's, uh, you know, big, a lot of support there. A lot of people are keen to see us, talk to us there. So um, we're going to focus on those areas. Um, and yeah, the, I think the Oakwood Recreation Centre is going to be, uh, you know, good fun, like an old school action. So, um, yeah. you know, that'll, that'll be fun down there. Well, you people from Portland uh, who think there's going to be something there, just drive down. It's not that far driving down the coast and it's a nice ride down uh, one uh, all the way down uh, to uh, Oakland and uh, people in Sacramento come down there to the, uh, the center, the uh, Islamic uh, Cultural Center in uh, San Francisco in Oakland. And that is once again uh, going to, that's going to be at two o'clock on Saturday, uh, Pacific Standard. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, have you gotten any flack at all? I, or, do you, are you running across anybody that uh, doesn't like Julian and giving you uh, heckling you at all in this entire? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the, there's the you know we had a couple of hecklers in Chicago, but just just one or two. You know, we were on the street. I think we we're on the street for three three hours or so, and 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 that was it. Every, everyone else was driving past, tooting their horns, and um, you know, showing the love. They handed out a lot of. Uh, a lot of flyers, like you know, three or four hundred flyers, went out went out that day. So um, I, that that was, and that and that's really been it. Um, you know, it's it's just been really just an outpouring of support. Uh, you know, blow, really blown away by the amount of support. Uh, we we just need to get a little bit of um, 
a little bit of that mainstream media love and then, uh, you know, we'll be away. Yeah, the home run for Julian, that's the number for Julian.com. Uh, it's the home run for Julian tour. And uh, as I said, you can uh, see where these events are taking place at home run for the number four. Julian.com. Uh, it's it, it's uh, this is twice you've been in the U.S. Uh, this year. I, you must be. I, I know you have to be restrained, but you must uh, be disappointed in the Biden administration's continuation or the appeal. They're the ones that started. No, actually started with Trump, and he continued uh, his administration uh, with the appeal. It must be very disappointing because uh, a lot of us were expecting a modicum of change. Yeah, I think I think we were sort of expecting a lot of change as well. Um, but I think I think really now is the now is the time when you know we're seeing we're seeing Garland dealing with these Trump era subpoenas uh, on journalists that are trying to use journalists to track down sources. Um, you know, they're pulling back on that. Um, I think you know the DOJ is is it's it's taken its time to settle down. You know, Dima's. Uh, who was the national security, um, the national security assistant attorney general? He's, uh, you know, he's he's gone now. So he was overseeing Julian's case. Uh, I think he left last week, um, or it was given his resignation. So, you know, there's a little bit of change happening in the DOJ, uh, you know, which really could signal that, um, you know, now's the time for everyone to sort of, uh, you know, just just get get involved, basically, get out there and. Um, Make sure your representatives know that you care about the freedom of press implications of this case. Okay, right. Uh, you, I, I heard you say maybe the last time you were on, the last time you saw your brother was last October, um, and uh, it's almost—it's been nine months. Uh, and uh, what was his condition like? For people out there, got to know what he's undergoing. Uh, we've seen the uh, report by uh, the special rapporteur on torture, uh, Nils Melzer, and uh, he saw him in 2019. Uh, so uh, just, I don't want to bring you back to that moment because uh, I'm sure it's a sore spot to thinking about it, but just let people know out there what he's going through. Well, I mean, I think, you know, he, the, the, these forces that are against him, they're trying, to, they're trying to crush him. You know, they're trying to crush his spirit and they're using everything in their power to do that, you know, through, um, you know, this abusive process you know, through the courts, um, putting him in a maximum security prison when he's actually an innocent person, uh, you know, withholding visits, uh, you know, during during this eight month period, all these things, like they all add up on a person. And, you know, Julian is, is immensely strong and he has, you know, so much courage, but he's just a human being like, like all of us. Yeah. And, 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 you know, if, if all these forces are, 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 are are put against you, you know, it has its effect. It takes its toll, um, and I've, you know, that's what that's what uh, you know I've noticed over, over these years. Uh, he, you know, one good news is that um, Stella and his children were able to go and see him in the prison uh, on on the weekend. So that's the first time, and he's had any visits since that October when I saw him. So I've, I've been banging on about that for the last, you know, the last three weeks over here, and and um, you know. Finally, he's he's been able to get a visit from Stella and the kids, so that that was um, you know that's some really good news. And and John talks to him and tells him you know what we're up to over here, and that you know gives him energy, uh, and 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 he likes to hear about that. So uh, yeah, if we keep doing stuff over here and we keep making things happen and, and getting more media and getting people's attention and having these great turnouts, uh, you know that that keeps Julian's spirit high. Yeah. Uh, so, so your father, John Shipton, and Julian's father, um, uh, he does speak to him. How often does he, uh, does, I mean, does, does a, Julian actually call him up, collect? How does that work uh, to, for him? Yeah, so Julian has credit. So he has, um, he gets 10, like a 10 minute time to call. Uh, and he has, uh, you know, you, you sort of buy credit at the prison um, and you have a certain amount of credit. Uh, and then you know, eventually that credit runs out. But he can have a 10-minute um, timed call through to John. Uh, it cuts out after 10 minutes. So uh, he, you know, he calls. He calls usually once a day from 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 inside the prison. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of demand 
for phone calls in the prison, so so he can't talk all the time. But um, yeah, usually once a day he's talking to John, and and John's, you know, I mean, we met someone, Colleen Rowley, yesterday. Uh, oh yeah, FBI. great. Uh, yeah, she, yeah, um, she's been to see Julian four or five times in the embassy, and so John was able to tell Julian that you know we met her, and and so you know these links to the outside world, they they. Um, you know, they give they give something uh, to Julian that that keeps him going. Well, it's tough on you. I know it's tough on uh, the entire family, and and I know it's tough on Stella and the, the two kids uh, to have to undergo this. Uh, I don't know what his daily routine is like. It, 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 I don't know if he has a television. He doesn't have access to a computer. It's it's really uh, it's torture as far as I'm concerned. For a guy who's an innocent man, he's guilty of committing journalism, uh, honest journalism, and exposing uh, mm. crimes uh, against humanity, uh, complete government and uh, corporate uh, corruption, and uh, of course, uh, mass surveillance, all of that. And um, that's, the, but that's what he's guilty of. And so I, what, what can people do? We only have a minute left. Uh, what should people do? What can they take out of this the home run for Julian uh, campaign and uh, anything else. What what can people actually do besides attending? Uh, well, so yeah, I guess we're we're asking people to, you know, just contact your congressperson, tell them that you care about this case and the implications for press freedom. Um, you know, talk to them about it. You know, a lot a lot of people uh, aren't really that. You know, into this case, it's been it's been a long time since since this is sort of sort of happening. So it's about reinvigorating people, talking to your friends and neighbours about it, and and just you know really really hammering on that this case this case is is uh, is going to set a, such a dangerous precedent and is already um, having a silencing effect on 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 the press and and the things that we can find out about our elected uh, elected officials all around the world, not just in the US. All right, we've been talking to Gabriel Shipton, brother of Julian Assange, home run for Assange.com. Uh, look it up and see when it's coming to your city. They're on the West Coast now and we'll conclude in DC uh, at the end of the month. I thank you, uh, Gabriel, for joining us. I, I know you're busy. I, I've, seen, I've seen your schedule, man. You're all over the place. Uh, you're a globetrotter, man. And uh, for Julian, uh, and uh, we're, we're here. Anytime we're on this thing and take right. out of there, okay? We're going to go out now uh, with, uh, once again, this is Nils Melzer. You heard the fast version of Moonlight Sonata. Nils is the one who really has been a like a comet that really energized uh, the movement to uh, free Assange when he came out with his report. And uh, so uh, here, this is Nils, the, the adagio version of uh, Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven, him playing the piano. All right, so uh, we'll see you Does next. Does he sing as well? Does Neil sing or just play? Does he sing? Yeah, out of tune. Uh, oh, he doesn't sing. No, he doesn't sing, but he plays a piano. He's a classic piano. Cla he plays classical piano. All right, I got to go. This has been Randy Credico, oh, Randy yeah. Live right. Fly on uh, uh, 99.5 FM in New York City, Assange Countdown to Freedom.com. Stay alert, folks. See you next week. Mm -hmm.